Our next guest is an entrepreneurial executive with expertise in operations, strategic planning, corporate management and consumer engagement in digital media and sports sectors. Having done interesting roles in his tenure with media companies, Rajesh D'Souza is now the business development director at the Data Sports Group, a data talks partner specializing in sports data solutions, content acquisition and management, and so much more. Today, we talk to Rajesh about the use of AI and data technologies in sports. Rajesh, welcome to the podcast. Great. Thanks for having me here and I'm happy to be here. Before we begin, we like to start off our sessions with an icebreaker. Are you ready for that? Yeah. What's your favorite quote, expression, or motto, and why is it your favorite? My favorite quote is from Vincent Lombardi. Um, it goes as winning is everything, but wanting to win, winning, sorry, winning isn't everything, but wanting to win is. Um, so. I like this quote. It particularly resonates with me very well. Uh, Vince Lombardi was uh, a legendary NFL coach uh, back in the 60s. Um, And I think this quote has a lot of meaning um, because it kind of encapsulates the essence of determination uh, and passion or drive to succeed. Um, I think it's, I think the quote really says a lot about having a strong desire and commitment to achieving your goals, regardless of the outcome. Um, And I think that applies not just to sports, right? It also applies to life Um, because in life, one doesn't win always, but the urge or the fire to win should always be there. So yeah, I love this quote, winning isn't everything, but wanting to win is. Wonderful, thank you so much for sharing. Rajesh, you have been a director in the sports industry for more than 20 years now, working with different solutions. How did this all begin? When did you first decide to pursue a career in sports? Yes, I used to follow soccer a lot when I was young. And I used to play the sport, but I wasn't particularly very athletic to make it far beyond, um, you know, playing it. But I used to, I used to have a hobby. I used to collect like newspaper clippings of soccer games um, to preserve historical events. Uh, and this was really just for my own personal memories. And this was a hobby that continued through my teen years as well. 20 years ago, I landed a job with a large UK media organization and I pursued a career in journalism, specifically sports content uh, and that in that realm. And since then, there was no looking back. Um, Through my career, I've worked with leading sports media organizations, um, and I'm really thankful for those experiences that I've had. So I have seen a whole ecosystem of sports data collection uh, and content production emerge over that last 20 years, uh, and it has evolved a lot over time. Um, A couple of weeks ago, I actually interviewed Nancy Hensley, who was one of the founding members of Mercury 13. Um, Mercury 13 is a group that invests in women's sports clubs in Europe and Latin America. And Nancy has a similar background to yours in the sense that she also works with AI and she's been a director in some of the biggest companies within, um, not just within sports, but um, in other industries as well. And I just kind of want to ask you a question that I asked her. What do you think uh, the significance of AI and data is in sports? Right. So artificial intelligence and data are transforming the sports industry in many ways. This is really on the pitch and off the pitch as well. On the pitch, you can see player development as a very key fundamental uh, area where artificial intelligence is used. AI has been used to analyze player performance data, to identify strengths and weaknesses, and to develop personalized training plans for players. There's a lot of way to track player performance and health data, but AI is letting you bring all of this together and get meaningful insights. You can get meaningful insights out of it. This also affects uh, different areas of uh, on the pitch you know, like recruitment and scouting, training, injury prevention, and the list goes on. So it's it's amazing where AI can touch 
uh, different facets of the game. Off the pitch, it's been used to improve fan engagement. Um, well, personalized experiences, right? So AI is employed to use, to engage with, to analyze fan preferences, allow sporting organizations to uh, provide personalized content, etc. So I think the integration of AI and data and sports, you know, it allows for more informed decision making. And I think enhance experiences for athletes and fans, right? So it's becoming an integral part of modern sports management. And I think it has the potential to reshape the landscape of the sporting industry. And I, I'm very curious because AI is something that, that has been there for a while, right? But why do you think that we're suddenly talking about it right now? Like you have been involved with AI for quite some time but on the mainstream sort of consumption of uh, new gadgets, new technology, AI is really at the forefront of all the conversations, uh, in part thanks to OpenAI and the work that they do. But why do you think that suddenly everyone is fascinated by AI, even though AI has been there for, for a while? Yeah, I think it's, uh, I think it kind of gives uh, the AI aspect uh brings a whole new element uh into the whole uh you know data landscape basically where people are tracking data uh and fan engagements and all that aspect so i think what is currently happening is that a lot of uh, a lot of clubs are partnering with different kinds of sports tech startups to actually see how they can drive AI for the benefit of improving different facets of their organization, right? I feel like it's not even just uh, large organizations because you see large organizations or sporting organizations having substantial resources and they can do much more extensive AI and data analytics capabilities. But even small clubs, right? They're actually trying to still derive that benefits and they're trying to leverage AI by working with, uh, with sports startups in order to understand what elements of their organization, either be it for, for the player development, be it for engaging with the fans, that they can improve on. So I think uh, it's just an exciting time to be there with, with, whole, with the whole open AI thing. It's, you are really coming to a point where you're seeing much more cost-effective solutions in the marketplace. And that's kind of expanding the masses or the kind of the, the amount of people that can, you know, get get their hands on the technology as well. So that's the reason why I think it's it's really a, a, a very good time to engage with AI. And you mentioned like cost effectiveness and smaller clubs and that uh, you, you sort of said that it doesn't just have to be the bigger clubs that get involved or start using and seeing the benefits of AI. But what are some of the ways that smaller clubs can can start using AI and, and benefit from AI? Like, do you have any examples of the things that smaller clubs can, can do to benefit from AI? Yeah, I think uh, I think for smaller clubs, I think gamification, uh, you know, is, is a very key fundamental element for engaging with your fan base. I think that's a that's a very it's not a one-sided approach. You're basically engaging with your fan base where you're creating aspects like tools or you know you're creating systems where you can allow your user fan base to actually uh, collect points, win certain challenges. And it kind of makes supporting the whole team very interactive and rewarding at the same time. So I think it's not just about the fun, it's also like a strategic tool, you know, for clubs to boost engagement or to grow their supporter base. So I, I feel gamification is a very interesting area where the club should actually use that to their benefit. Focusing on gamification, it I like I kind of like underscores like a commitment, you know, to have interactive fan experiences. So in a gamified world, I think you know, fans will actually be much more aligned to uh, interacting with the team or the club on a on a regular basis, as opposed to just consuming information. So I find that as a very interesting approach for clubs to take. And what is gamification, just for people that don't know? Because we, Dust Talks has partnered with DSG to um, 
to help with the gamification element, especially with some of the, well, we we don't just use it for the smaller clubs, but for all clubs really. But um, what what is gamification for people that don't know? Yeah, so gamification transforms the fan experience uh, into an engaging game uh, using tools like points, badges, and challenges um, to make supporting a team more interactive and more rewarding. Uh, it's not just about the fun element. It's like a strategic tool for clubs to boost engagement, grow support, you know, their supporter base. The partnership that we have with DSC has with Data Talks, I think will focus on this gamification feature. It underscores the commitment to enhancing this kind of uh, fan experience. The simple thing with game, in a gamified world is fans just earn some kind of reward. Or it's either points, you know, for various kinds of activities that they do on the club's website or mostly online, maybe some offline kind of activities as well. I think beyond the enjoyment, I think the, the gamification aspect, you know, it strengthens fan loyalty by making the overall experience more exciting and rewarding. So ultimately, what it benefits the club is they get valuable data on their fan behavior, uh, their preferences, and what kind of engagement patterns they have, you know. So the club can then understand their fan base much more better. I think this is a wonderful uh, tool for the clubs, you know, to uh, to increase their engagement and learn from their uh, supporter base and then improve on what initiatives that they do. And you have, um, you've mentioned like the, the loyalty, the fan engagement, the growing your supporter base as some of the best use cases for um, gamification. But I'm wondering, of course, without naming any names or if you can name names, that's that's totally up to you. Do you have any um, success stories that you can share with us from when you at DSG used gamification to sort of help clubs with those specific things? Like what 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 was the context? What did you what did the club do and how did they end up benefiting in the ways that you have just given examples of? Yeah, sure. So I can give you two particular kind of use cases. Um, one is a fan engagement challenge. So a football club, we were working with a football club that introduced like a season-long prediction challenge for their fans, where the fans can earn points by predicting correctly and guessing those match outcomes or guessing who the scorers were for the club and other game-related events. So I think the success story there was... The, that challenge significantly increased their fan engagement with their, you know, with the fans, the club and the fans got, I think, to another uh, level in just in terms of how their engagement was. And thousands of fans are like really participating each week in these contests. So uh, that was like one fan engagement challenge. The other thing that we we have seen is uh, a baseball team that used Arbor data to automate uh, a full social media marketing campaign. Uh, whenever, you know, there was a home run, so they were, this is called as moment marketing. So basically when the game was on and there was a home run, you know, the team's marketing de department could identify the buzz and they were using that buzz to push uh, team sponsors, right? Their sponsors and their affiliate uh, partners, they were pushing offers on social media. So I think this kind of like automated uh, marketing strategy goes much more beyond uh you know, it gives a very immediate impact. It transforms everything, uh, you know, from that heat home run is actually a, a valuable marketing opportunity for them. So I think the sponsors in their case actually appreciated that kind of dynamic um, and that targeted approach. So I feel that really uh, was a very good use case of how, uh, you know, this kind of data could be used for different kinds of stuff. And if a sports club or anyone working at a sports organization hears what you're saying and they're really, really interested in, in getting started, what would you say are some of the things that they need to think about before they get started? I feel like they just need to, uh, I think the main thing is to define clear objectives because you have to clearly, you have to clearly outline what the uh, strategy is, basically what they feel that they that they want to achieve out of this. So by first understanding that aspect, then they would be able to, you know, derive specific outcomes from it. So, so either if it's, uh, uh, you know, if they want to engage or enhance their fan engagement or optimize some of their operations that actually helps them uh, or improve marketing effect uh, on an immediate basis, 
I think that will sort of guide their strategy forward. So it will it's kind of understanding what their objectives are and then working based on that objectives, providing solutions that could sort of, you know, uh, target that objective in a very structured manner. Now, let's look ahead in the next maybe five years. Where do you see the sports industry in terms of their adoption of AI and data with OpenAI introducing GPTs, which help um, non-coders create new technologies using plain language, which I'm excited about because I can't code, to be honest. Uh, it feels like with all of that, anything is possible. Or what do you think? Like, Where do you see the sports industry taking AI in the next five years? I feel like it's going to see significant advancements uh, in the adoption of AI, you know, and these data-driven technologies in the sporting world. Like you rightly said, I mean, the introduction of uh, these kind of user-friendly AI tools like GPTs, right? They are mm-hmm. they're able to democratize the development of AI applications within the sports industry, like non-technical professionals, you know, such as coaches or marketeers or analysts. I think they can use these tools to create AI-driven solutions without any coding experience. So that's a fantastic accessibility option for a wide variety of people. And I think with the in the sports industry, smart stadiums and fan experiences will continue to evolve. So I think they'll contribute towards an evolution of uh, improving the stadium experience or the overall fan experience as a whole. So I feel uh, that's one area it will touch upon really well. I want to ask you a question that I asked you just before this one, which was in that context, we were talking about gamification, but now I kind of want to take the same question into AI. And I would love for you to complete the sentence, if you if you will. Um, and this is advice that you would be giving directly to clubs. Um, the sentence is, before you start thinking about investing in AI, you should... Uh, you should clearly define your specific goals and objectives, understanding the specific outcomes of what you want to achieve, uh, whether it's uh, you know on the pitch like improving player performance or off the pitch with your user base, enhancing your fan engagement with your supporters. I think uh, that will guide your AI investment strategy. So I think having a well-defined roadmap uh, not only will help these clubs in selecting the most relevant AI applications, but it will be more focused and an effective implementation for, you know, for them to choose from. Mm. And the advice that you're giving, which was the same for the gamification, is probably one of the sort of most commonly given advice when it comes to business strategy or anything that firstly define your goals. So is the message that you're that you're giving out, Rajesh, simply that it doesn't really matter which technology you're applying, you should still use that same logic of know why you want to use that thing and then start using that thing so that you can actually measure and see if you have been able to do it successfully. So it doesn't matter that today we're talking about AI, maybe in the next five years we could be talking about a completely new technology that doesn't exist now, but the, the the answer is always just know what you want to get out of it and define your goals. Am I am I hearing you correctly, or so, or what yeah. would you say to that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, that's that actually is the key for key element is to really uh, have uh, should clearly define your kind of specific goals and objectives for what you want to use it for, because ultimately that will just drive more efficiency in how you implement it and how you use it on a going basis. So I feel by clear, you know, first of all, clearly uh, having these objectives uh, uh, in mind will then help develop a proper roadmap in terms of how, uh, you know, you want to go about achieving those kind of goals. And I think that's a very important uh, highlight or sort of point to underline because I think that sometimes when it comes to new technologies, people sort of like, it's like a deer in headlights, right? Something is new, so you freeze, you don't know what to do with it. So then logic kind of goes out the door or you run away from it because you're like, I don't know what to do with it. It's new, you know? So it's, I think that's a very important point to make uh, for anyone that's listening, that it really, at the end of the day, you need to know why you want to use something, what you want to achieve from it, and then proceed and not just go into it uh, blindly. Yeah, just to add to that, I mean, uh, 
you know, we, we've spoken about this a little bit before. It's basically that larger organizations like sporting organizations can go out there and, and farm and get a lot more tools at their at their uh, and resources because they have the resources to use and try out different tools. But as you go down the the, the ladder, uh, you'll find smaller clubs needing to will need to stretch out out of pocket to really make sure that they're buying the right technologies or they're using the right technologies. So they will need to have that kind of uh, you know thought process in terms of what they want to achieve from it and also one of the advantages is that maybe smaller clubs could actually pool resources uh, and knowledge with different maybe with the same federation or the or the league that they're playing or the fellow clubs that that, that are using certain tools so i think that's where it will sort of like then drive this adoption of technology across all levels of uh, sporting organizations not not just at the elite top and when you talk about pooling of resources we work with a with a league here in sweden as well that um um decided to go into data driven and data informed decision making so they started working with us and what they do is that they basically um cover the costs for the entire league and uh they try to roll out uh, the software that we use for the different clubs that use the the software for the different clubs that they have and that's because otherwise it if it was left to individual clubs one because of resources like money wise it would be very difficult to do but then two because of human resources who's going to run this project how are you going to explain it change management all those different things it would have been difficult to do otherwise so that's a really uh, another great uh, tip that you just gave there about just pooling of resources in order to make sure that you don't miss out and do you have any other advice for like practical advice such as the one that you just gave about pooling of resources of how smaller sports clubs can actually start to uh, sort of use um, technology, AI, etc. if they're afraid that they don't have enough resources. I think that's a great example that you gave basically on the on the basis that a league is actually then propagating these tools down to the clubs because that's a clear case of, you know, clubs not, not having those manpower to use those tools or to run the the tools on their end i think for for smaller clubs i i feel like it's it's more uh and it it's more an interesting element for them to explore different kinds of options that are there uh i feel uh clubs can uh the budgets that they had they work with probably are very uh, minimal in, in with in smaller cases but I think they should work with a lot more with sports tech startups because by using leveraging what the sports tech startups do because they are very excited to work with clubs and at the same time for them to work with elite clubs is very difficult so um it's a it's a win-win situation for both so the smaller clubs can actually benefit on latest technology which uh, a tech startup will you know sort of bring to market and for the tech startup, it's kind of interesting for them to actually play, uh, to actually promote it as a good use case, you know, with, with these kind of clubs that are uh, that are testing their product. So, I feel uh, smaller clubs need to uh, work more with uh, with tech startups and ensure that they can actually leverage some technology into their into their decision making processes, uh, be it in all gamuts of their business operation. So. That is maybe one one useful tip I could give for for clubs that are looking, uh, you know, to 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 engage and get new tools in the market. Wonderful! Thank you so much for such um, very clear, practical tips. Because sometimes in uh, in these conversations, it can be difficult for without a concrete example and a concrete tip of like this is what you can do. It can be very difficult to navigate because. Uh, Experts take it for granted that, well, the, it can be such a steep learning curve for people that haven't been involved with AI or with technology. So, so when you give information and it's very philosophical, it can be very difficult to, to take it and run with it. So thank you so much for such uh, practical tips that I'm sure that our listeners will really appreciate. Rajesh, if anyone listening to the podcast is very excited about what you've just spoken about and would love to be in contact with you, how can they get in contact? Right. So uh, anyone can reach me on email. Uh, it's rajesh.desouza at datasportsgroup.com. Uh, but I'm also available on LinkedIn. So 
I normally I'm on LinkedIn uh, not very frequently, but I'm still there. But people can connect with me and drop me a message. I will I'll be sure to respond and engage with them. Wonderful! Thank you so much for joining us on the Sports CDP Crush Course. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Lauren, for having me here.